This is probably one of the last workshops of the People's Climate Summit. Today is the second day of the workshops. This is the last time slot. But I want to assure you that while it might be the last in the program, it's certainly not the last, at least in my personal reckoning, in terms of importance. I believe the issue is very, very important. And um, again, I want to really welcome you and, and uh, appreciate um, on a very personal level that you made the track over here, just seeing how difficult it is during that COP to go from A to B, find your places, um, and, and deal with just the multitude of great offerings of, of workshops that are held. So we are very appreciative that you are, that you are here. Maybe just really quickly, um, allow, my, um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Liana Schalatek. I work with an organization called the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, or Heinrich Böll Foundation. That is one of the German political foundations. In our case, it's the one affiliated with the Green Party. However, I sit in the office in Washington, and I like to joke that it's far removed from Berlin that allows me to do what I'm really interested in. And in my case, this is a kind of an interest and a passion that thanks to the Heinrich Böll Foundation, I was actually able to pursue over the last couple of years. And that was looking very specifically at the intersection between um, climate finance and then the gender dimension. And when I take a so uh, talk about both climate finance and gender, we are always talking in a justice framework. So we are approaching it from a climate justice perspective, and we can go into that if needed, what that entails with respect to financing. But we are also talking from a gender justice and a human rights and women's rights uh, based perspective. So this is just very important um, for, for you, because I tend to get at some point um, speak in, in techno language and throw around funds and other stuff. That does not mean that I'm not looking at it again from a justice perspective with a human rights framing and with the understanding that uh, you know there are fundamental uh, imbalances in the way um, the uh, climate regime is administrated and that pertains to finance as well. Uh, but obviously when you engage and when you try to change outside, and we hear a lot of great um, examples of what is happening on the outside and within parts of the climate system, then that's sometimes you know, the, 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 the technical approach that you need to have. So um, what we have um, today is a, is a great set of, of speakers, and we can do that either as formal or informal as we want it to be, um, and I let them introduce themselves in, in, in just a second. Um, I wanted to get like a little show on, of hand because what we are obviously trying to do is to bring two issue areas or two linkages together. One is the world of climate finance. So can I maybe see a show of hand of how many of you feel that they have a decent understanding what climate finance is, what some of the players are, what we are talking about. And if not, that's not a problem because that's a workshop. We have plenty of opportunity, if you don't get tired of my voice, for me to do some of that introduction. It's just a matter of, you know, no need to repeat things that is known. But if you're interested in getting like a rough overview of what climate finance is, what are some of the players, what are some of the problems that we are seeing, before we are then looking out how that intersects with um, with gender and gender equality and women's rights, then we would start out this way. So is that okay for everybody to start out with a kind of a climate finance overview or rough introduction? And again, this is, we are a small enough group to make it really interactive. Uh, stop me and everybody else from talking when you wanna have something clarified if you feel that, 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 that you're not quite clear what it is we are talking about, if you feel you want to have a, a question then. So it's not a formal presentation and a cue and answer session, it's really a joint learning that we are trying to do. So um, again, I introduce myself, let me allow my wonderful co-talkers and sharers of information to introduce themselves and I'm really happy that they are here because everybody has such a busy schedule right now. And we'll start out with Emilia. Um, obviously, once you've seen Emilia, you will 
remember seeing her and um, Amelia is not just memorable for the color of her hair, <laughs> although that usually in changing generations um, is very memorable, but she's also particularly memorable for the work that she's doing. And so um, um, she's just going to introduce herself quickly and then we'll probably um, take up various segments one after the other. Yeah. Hi, uh, it's really an honor to be here with you. Uh, my name is Emilia, I come from Mexico, from a feminist organization. And we do a lot of work um, in the grassroots level with a program called Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights and Access to Legal Abortion. And we do a lot of work also training uh, grassroots and trying to strengthen their leadership in this agenda. But we also monitor the, the health agenda in this regard. And then the other program is mine, is on gender equality, public policies and budgets towards sustainable development. So what we do is train governments and other agencies, for instance the UN, in finding legal, programmatic and budgetary frameworks for gender equality and sustainable development. And from this uh, training, we got a very good sense of what governments do, what are their needs, what are their installed capacities, what are their challenges. But at the same time, we are part of the feminist movement, and this is why we like to do advocacy at the global level, national level, and find the coherence between these lines from the needs of uh, movement, of women on the ground, and this is why we're doing a lot of advocacy in several processes, the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, uh, Habitat, the, the New Urban Agenda, the Sendai Program of Action, and uh, the Financial for, for Development. Great. Aline, you want to go next? Yes. And Hi. sorry, because of that stupid pillar here, it's a little bit hard for everybody to see everybody. Hi, my name is Aileen Mairena. I'm from Nicaragua. I am an indigenous mosquito from the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. I work for the Center, Center of Autonomy and Development of Indigenous People. We work in different areas. We work for um, traditional knowledge. Um, we work with uh, climate change monitoring and follow up in the communities. And uh, we work in um, uh, uh, technology technology and innovation of agriculture. And uh, CATP, the center, is part of a global initiative with um, 13 organizations in 17 countries uh, that we work in climate advocacy at international level. I'm, and I am part of this uh, group of um, indigenous people that work in following up all the activities in the Green Climate Fund working for the IP policy and uh, safeguard and rights of indigenous people inside the, the HCC. Uh, good evening everyone. My name is uh, Benso Matix Lopakusa. I am a woman. Sorry, can you all hear her or does can she you hear me? To speak up a little bit? <laughs> you can hear all hear me. But I am so fine. Yeah, my name is Benso Matix Lopakusa. I work with Center for 21st Century Issues, a non governmental organization based in Lagos, Nigeria. And in our organization, we work around the issues of environment and climate change. And it's also issues of environment and climate change is also linked to health, environmental health. And then we work also on governance and education. And gender is a cross cutting issue in almost all, everything that we do in our organization. And basically, when we're looking at the issue of climate change and environment, we are also we are raising a lot of awareness in the local communities about what climate change is and how the folk citizen can get engaged around climate change. Apart from that, we also work on climate change, the food and climate justice. We've just uh, finished a research with uh, Oxfam on food and climate justice, especially as it relates to women small scale farmers and how much the government is, is investing in small scale farmers in Nigeria. We looked at uh, the fundings coming from the international uh, system and we looked at local funding, how much is the government investing, how much is the international partners also investing in the small, female, small scale female farmers 
in Nigeria. I mean, we had a lot of interesting results from that uh, research. And based on that research, we are now going to start another phase of the project, which is uh, using the results of that research to do some interventions that will actually help and work for women and how women we have a lot of access to funding in terms of addressing climate change within the food and climate justice nexus. And then in the area of education, we look at uh, the vulnerable children, out of school children. And then also in the areas of health, it's very, very important we link health with climate change. And we do a lot around community participation in health. And then also looking at health infrastructure and how, infrastructure and how it has been working well for the people, and if they have problems, how do they report to those problems, who takes account of those problems, who addresses those challenges and things like that. So we build the community around the primary healthcare systems to be able to measure, uh, to monitor service delivery. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, and as you can already tell, those are you know great experiences on working with women and for women and communities on the ground. And um, a lot of the focus um, that, that basically all of our interaction here has, um, the public, uh, you know, the international, national, and, and local connection is really ensuring that that very abstract thing called climate finance, and we go into what it is and what it is not, um, actually benefits those activities of, uh, you know, great women uh, like, like Aileen, um, like Emilia and like Titia and the organizations and communities um, that they work with and that they serve on the ground. And unfortunately, maybe that as a startup right now, a lot of the climate finance structure and international architecture um, is set up in a way that at best, you know, what you get at least through a lot of the international and, and, and national um, bilateral funding streams is like a trickle down. You know, eventually, if you are lucky, something might arrive. You know, at at um, at Emilia's organization, at Titi's organization, uh, like at, at uh, Aileen's um, uh, partners. Uh, but it's not necessarily the primary focus um, of how financing, uh, climate financing, is currently structured and governed. And actually, it's, it's then people, and again, uh, both Aileen and Titi have already mentioned that they also work on a global level on something called the Green Climate Fund, which is a large uh, multilateral climate fund, um, where I also spend quite a bit of time uh, uh, working. And it's then at that level that you're trying to change, actually, the way policies and the governance of climate finance um, is, is changed. So it's very much so a global to local connections and the fewer quote unquote intermediaries, people that come in between and take a piece of the barapai you have, the better it is in order to serve um, not only climate justice, meaning making money available uh, to the poorest people in developing countries, but also gender justice, ensuring that the money that comes forward is benefiting men and women equally and that it contributes uh, to gender equality and women's empowerment. Okay, so I have a couple of slides. Uh, first of all, Heinrich Böll Foundation, we already mentioned that we work in a lot of offices worldwide. Rather, Sina is a colleague um, that is here uh, from the office uh, in, in Brussels. We work, work a lot on, on gender democracy, on sustainable development, on climate um, uh, and energy policies. There's a lot of things that we are doing it. Again, I'm from the Washington DC office. Maybe really quickly and very simply. First of all, what is climate finance? Um, it's very hard to clearly define what it is. And the reason is because there is no single accepted or universally accepted definition. And that has very often political reason because if you have a very clear definition, it will be much harder uh, for some to actually declare what they're financing as climate finance, and we come to that into a little bit. So more often it's defined uh, via the purpose of for, uh, for what it's used. And so a lot of time when you talk about climate finance, you think about money that is made available for specific climate actions, roughly in three large fields. One is adaptation, actually dealing uh, with resilience and improving 
uh, on the effects of climate uh, change addressing vulnerabilities. One is mitigation, shifting to a low emission, low carbon and equitable and democratic uh, development pathway. Equitable and democratic is what we want, that's not necessarily what is currently inherent in the financial architecture. And the last one is what is usually grouped together under red, meaning the whole complex of issues that is dealing with deforestation, forest degradation and forest conservation efforts. Um, and again, for all of that, you could go into a lot more detail, but just as a quick overview. Um, also, you have a bunch of actors or kind of flow streams, if you want, through which climate finance is channeled. Um, so what you have is within the context of the Climate Framework Convention. Um, this is the one on which we are going to spend quite a bit of time. But it's very important to understand that that's just one of many, many channels uh, through which climate finance can flow. So um, that means that the COP23 here in Bonn can try to influence some of those players and set some of the larger dynamic of climate finance. But private sector capital might um, not necessarily deal with that or follow that mandate. The multilateral development banks and UN agencies, which are also very large players in their own right, might or might not follow that. There is a lot of um, bilateral climate finance that is provided as part of so-called overseas development, official development assistance. And then, and this is very important, but obviously um, very often forgotten for political reasons, you have the domestic allocation, meaning what developing countries are already doing, you know, from their own uh, finances and, and putting it from their own budgets and putting it towards uh, climate purposes. And again, in the context that we are talking about, obviously climate finance can be used uh, by developed and developing countries. Um, Netherlands has adaptation um, needs, financial needs as well. Uh, the city of New York had huge adaptation finance needs, uh, you know, after Hurricane Sandy. But when we are talking here in that context, we are usually talking about the climate flows from developed to developing countries. So particularly as, as public climate finance um, is concerned. So that um, as a background. And now that you've seen that there are quite a number of streams, I think this little diagram, don't look at the wording, just look at that onion as it's called is very instructive because that shows you the dimension of things that are labeled climate finance. However, not all climate finance is created equal, right? So the climate finance that comes and is basically controlled by the framework convention is just that little tiny spot here. This is stuff that goes through the multilateral development bank. This is some, you know, official development assistance that has some climate relation. And then there is the huge plethora of other funding that might have some climate-related um, activity is either public or private. But again, we have no clear definition. But that just shows you, like, the core funding and the one that we have to push for to make it 100% gender response, uh, responsive as a matter of climate justice and gender justice is that stuff here that is under the UNFCCC. And why? Because under the Climate Convention, there is something called a climate finance obligation. So this is really, really important, and it's a core central tenet of climate justice, uh, which basically says that the developed countries, as the ones that have caused the pollution, need to help developing countries in actually catching up and addressing climate harm that is already resulting. And they need to do that by providing finance in order to um, do a number of things. So, and again, this is very important. It's a financial obligation. It's not aid. It's not something that you give as charity out of the goodness of the heart. This is an obligation that developed countries have towards developing countries. So, and again, this is at the basis of, of climate justice. So when you hear a lot of de developing countries talk about climate justice more broadly for the financial effect, this is exactly this discourse. And maybe just one more um, uh, uh, little, little slice. I'm not quite sure whether the numbers are 100% correct anymore, but I don't think 
that's the importance. It just shows what it illustrates, that you actually have the largest set of uh, population already severely affected and hindered in their development potential by uh, existing climate finance in the global um, south. But they have contributed historically the least um, of the emissions. And to deal with that imbalance, you have both the climate finance obligation and um, you have um, a, a set of funds under the UNFCCC um, that are supposed to basically deal with this. Okay, let me just see what is important. Yeah, I think we don't need to go into that. So, there were in the, in the, over the last couple of years a couple of focal points, and you might have heard some of those numbers being already uh, thrown around. Uh, probably the most important one, and that goes back now almost eight years, is a commitment that was made um, at the Copenhagen COP, which was COP15, I think, was it COP15, the ones of us that have been there longer? Yeah, 15. And that was actually the promise by developed countries to jointly mobilize 100 billion per year by 2020. So you might have heard the 100 billion per year quite a bit, but again, remember, nobody knows exactly what climate finance is, what it entails. Um, you can see that um, they talk about the pop, uh, uh, that it could be from a variety of sources, could be public, could be private, could be bilateral, could be multilateral, or alternative, for example, a tax would be an alternative form of finance. And what is very important also to note is that nobody says how those 100 billion should be composed. Mm -hmm. So there is, for example, in the discussion, no guarantee whatsoever that the majority or even a significant part of it would be public finance. We would assume so, but that's by no means the case. As a matter of fact, developed countries have used that uncertainty of the definition and the variety of sources to basically argue that, let's say, one million that they put in in um, public money, uh, when that leads to six million in some sort of private investment, that they have mobilized seven million, right? And so what you see is a lot of focus by developed countries now on arguing on leveraging the private sector. And that's very self-serving as well. Of course you need the private sector to come in. And of course, you know, you want to shift the way the private sector invents, uh, invests towards low carbon and sustainable development pathways. That's not the question. The question is how much of it should count towards the obligation of developed countries. And this is a very strong ongoing fight here in the international climate system. And that's why you hear a lot about, you know, um, you need to have a clear accounting rules. For example, even in public, at the moment, a loan, which is something that needs to be repaid, is counted the same way, largely, as um, a grant. So obviously there is a difference if I give you 10 million as a grant, because you get the 10 million, and you use it, you do your measure, and hopefully it benefits your society. If you get the 10 million as a loan, that means you need to ensure that you can only invest it in something which has a return on investment and you can make sure that you repay what you repay plus a little bit of interest, even if it's concessional and lower than it would be on market rates. And that has very much so an impact from a gender perspective um, what we want to ask for. So for gender just um, climate finance, we want to maximize the public provision of climate finance and we want to make sure that a lot of that is delivered in the form of grants and not in the form of loans. And we want to make sure, and that's not trying to repeat you know, the narrative of women as the victims, but we want to make sure that adaptation, resilience building, dealing with the effect of climate change gets its fair shares. Because when you look at climate finance flows and public climate flows even um, um, overarching, then a lot more money is, is put into mitigation, meaning emissions reductions in developing countries, than it is in adaptation dealing with the impact of climate change and building the resilience of population. And again, 
this is not altruistic, it's very self-serving. The idea very often behind that is that you say you can reduce emissions much cheaper in a developing country than at home. So by giving more money, you know, of climate for, for mitigation, you are hoping that it allows you basically to um, not have to ramp up your own ambition in, in the north. And again, those are very important um, uh, considerations. So, and then um, as part of, of that discourse, um, there was also the development of a new large multilateral fund, which is called the Green Climate Fund. And the idea there was that this fund in particular would channel a lot of its funding, a lot of the share of the multilateral funding for adaptation. And again, with a view to addressing some of the imbalances um, that we have. Let me just see, that might be enough. Okay, now I'll show you those two just and then we'll leave it, we'll open it up and see if there are questions because I see a couple of, you know, frowns or squinting eyes and some of it might have to do with the, with the slides but might be good to get some clarification and then we'll probably, um, I'll go into what is achieved in, in terms of funds and then we hear um, the examples from our great colleagues of what they are doing and what kind of finance they are engaging with and what kind of finance they need. So maybe just those really quickly, uh, how much does climate change um, cost globally? And we talked about the 100 million, uh, billion. This is this. So it's not a lot. Uh, just also to mention that we haven't even secured that much per year yet. Um, this is, and I don't even think the, the numbers are necessarily up to date, but this is what it would cost just for mitigation annually, this is what it would cost for adaptation, and just to give you an, um, to an example, they are a little bit older, but an extreme flood in either Thailand or Pakistan or Superstorm Sandy, and we are talking, you know, one large event of extreme weather exposure can already um, cost a significant amount of money and actually affect uh, developing country economies um, to a much greater extent um, than any climate finance, even if we reach um, the Copenhagen commitment. Um, again, and it's not even quite clear if we are getting there anytime soon, um, can, can build. And that's why, and I want to stop there, that's why you also hear in this COP a lot of discussion about something called the loss and damage finance. This is actually talking in the realm of finance that need to be provided for when you go beyond what is possible with adaptation and resilience building, when you're really talking about a loss of culture, of livelihood, people to have to move. Uh, in effect, you are talking about a compensation, even if the word can be used um, here in, 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 in the negotiations. And then when you can see how one single event, massive event, uh, how much damage that can already cost, and that's not taking into account like the damage for resetting, for example, for slow onset events, um, when you know entire islands have to be evacuated and people have to move away, you can see that we are talking really a lot about a lot of finance necessary, which is also why developed countries do not like to uh, talk about loss and damage finance as something that they are obli obligated to provide. Yes, please. Um, just to be clear, it, it seems as though these markers would be moving so the figures in, are these 2017 figures or are they? Those are examples. I mean, some of the, the markers are obviously moving. And again, um, some of the problems that we have, no clear definition. There are also a lot of estimates out there. The only thing that hasn't moved, unfortunately, is the 100 billion commitment. As I said, it was first set in 2009. We are eight years later. Uh, that hasn't been adjusted up. What is even worse, the 100 billion is actually used as the baseline for the Paris implementation, meaning, you know, the Paris Agreement does not say, okay, we need then at least 200 billion, a million, uh, 200 billion or 300 billion by that at that time frame. They only um, agreed to basically start discussing that they need to go after the 100 billion, but in 2025. So in a way, you are losing in the discussion and then the process, and you're right, the goalposts of what all of that costs shifts all the time. 
right? But in that time frame, what you have as the willingness, and again, this is not a number that is based on need. That was a political commitment, right? This is a political number. That's not a need-based number. Very important, and that hasn't shifted. And again, um, those of us who have been in the process for the Paris Agreement have seen a lot of efforts to, of countries, of developed countries, to wiggle out of even getting a reference to the 100 billion and the need to upscale from that into the agreement. And so that's the last picture on the architecture that I want to leave you with. And that's how it looks, unfortunately. So some people have referred to it as a spaghetti bowl or whatever, looks like a, like a puzzle. But all of those little dots here are actors in the climate, global climate finance architecture, which means it's complex. Uh, there are a lot of players. Lots of them have their own rules. Um, and that means that obviously, if you're trying to get climate finance gender responsive, you need um, to, to very carefully look at which ones um, might be a good start in terms of a good, good fund to start, um, which is why some of us have, for example, looked at the Green Climate Fund as something of um, a new player. Um, that, that we felt it was very important to engage with. Again, you've seen that was, that was a decision from 2009 to set up that fund. Um, what we had around the time is just a lot of those funds popping up. A lot of them didn't even exist before. A lot of bilateral international players came on the line. Um, and then again, you had a new fund being created. And so um, a lot of us from civil society, from the advocacy, were bound and determined to ensure that the Green Climate Fund as a completely new actor might become uh, or could become a different fund and that would mean for example a fund that would think gender as it was developed or gender inclusive as it was developed and not what you have actually with a lot of the other players that have been already on the scene where they added some sort of a gender component. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just really quickly mention so, and I'm sorry, there's a lot more. I don't know where I have it. No, I don't have it here. But um, what I wanted um, to mention is, um, uh, again, for a lot of existing funds, gender, or thinking about how to integrate gender in the funding work that they're doing, um, it didn't come from the very beginning. You know, they wrote their, their various um, operative policies, how they want to fund, for whom they want to fund, how you access funding. Um, gender did not play a role of it. However, a number of them have started to quote-unquote retrofit um, gender in the sense, um, and it's actually not all bad news, in the sense that a lot of them have actually really figured out how can you um, integrate some gender dimension into um, a climate fund, um, and sometimes it's in the way that they are looking at, um, you know, how they are demanding what, what funds uh, need to take into account, like including social and gender co-benefits, or when they are stipulating, um, uh, you know, what are the population groups that you need to take um, particular attention to in bringing them into consultation. The important part here, though, is, again, it's very much so a retrofit, which means that gender was not thought of necessarily from the very beginning uh, as a way to make a fund different, to make sure that funding is different and for different kind of actions. Um, ideally, when you talk about gender responsiveness or gender responsive funding, you would not want to see business as usual funding, for example, a large um, dam. Uh, which is a renewable energy project would not be a gender responsive renewable energy project because it's not in line with protecting the human rights and the livelihoods of women and the communities they live in. So those are all very, very important considerations. And again, the Green Climate Fund, which is a new actor, uh, did a couple of things a little bit differently. Find that here quickly. I'm sorry. It's as you can see, it's part of a of a much larger PowerPoint. 
So um, what they did there is it, it's, a, it's a little bit differently, and, and those of us, and that includes the Heinrich Böll Foundation and other civil society organizations that have worked in it from the very beginning, have actually very uh, consciously um, uh, um, pursued a dual strategy. And the dual strategy was obviously we wanted to make sure that there is a dedicated gender policy and a gender action plan, something that the UNFCCC, again, in a retrofit, the UNFCC as a, as a climate convention has been already existing for more than 20 years. It's now thinking of how it can integrate gender and what kind of actions it needs to integrate gender. Again, the, the retrofit. Um, so there is a clear acknowledgement that you need a specific gender policy and a gender action plan, but it can't it cannot start there and it cannot stop there. And in the Green Climate Fund, we have then, for example, um, uh, attempted to make sure that a reference and an understanding for the need for gender is included in key operational policies. For example, if you want to work with the fund and get money from the fund in order to implement a project, in most of the funds you need to become accredited. So you need to have a formal relationship. And for the Green Climate Fund, it was from the beginning very clear that if you want to work with the Green Climate Fund, um, you have to show proof that you have an own gender approach within uh, the organization, meaning you have a gender policy, you have some track record um, of, of, of dealing with gender, um, you have some gender expertise, or if you're not having that yet, then you have to build it before you get the first funding from the Green Climate Fund. And what is the very interesting part, and again, the Green Climate Fund is new, so we have not seen a lot of it in action yet, but it's very interesting in the Green Climate Fund, it doesn't just affect the public players like the UN agencies or the multilateral development bank, most of which have a gender policy and you know have their own gender mainstreaming understanding, but also commercial banks. So that led two things like, for example, the Deutsche Bank, uh, becoming accredited um, by the Green Climate Fund, but then being told by the Green Climate Fund before you can do the first project with us, you need to have a gender policy and you need to have an internal gender capacity, which of course they didn't have. So in a way, that's very interesting because it forced, and you can argue, you know, it's just a policy, it doesn't mean anything, but it's a first engagement um, and in a first formal engagement that with that, it forced, for example, the Deutsche Bank um, to develop a gender. And that's something that I'm pretty sure the, the, the board of governors or whatever the Deutsche Bank had, all very high paid men, I'm pretty sure, would never have done if they hadn't an interest, probably a lot for greenwash and publicity uh, reasons to want to work with the Green Climate Fund, right? And so, for example, the fact that then the set of criteria that the board of the Green Climate Fund uses in order to evaluate whether they support a project or not does include some gender um, uh, equality references or benefit, approval of gender equality references and benefits. Again, it's not perfect, but it's an important start. Okay, so maybe that as the larger background, and again, we can go maybe through some of the examples on some of the things that we would like to see. Are there questions? Or are you all kind of dead and saying, oh my god, what kind of seminar did I get into? That's <laughs> not what I wanted to hear. Um, I have a feeling currently there is a lot of talk about technology transfer from mm -hmm. developed to developing countries. I guess this is covered by mitigation. Does it? No, in not necessarily. It's also part. Uh, it's also yeah, yeah. can also be part How does it of. Fit into of this uh, you mean into gender responsiveness? Yeah, uh, not in, but into the general framework that you show. Well, I mean, obviously, um, uh, with a lot of the projects that you have in general, you know, that are financed, very often there are some technology approaches, and I think it's very again, uh, technology is is actually a very great example to show that not all technologies are created uh, equal and that men and women in the various contexts that they are working might have a very different understanding of the kind of technology they need and they want to have funded or supported as part of the projects. 
Um, I think agriculture is, for example, a very, very good example. Um, depending, you know, when, when you know that a lot of the, the, the women in developing countries work actually more in subsistence agriculture, focused on the food provision for households, and, you know, a lot more of the male agricultural work, working force is ex more export-oriented agriculture. And again, it's, it's, it's just tendencies. Obviously, you know, you will have male subsistence farmer and you will have uh, female agricultural entrepreneurs, but, but if you look at the overwhelming majorities, that's the case, then it becomes very clear that from an agricultural adaptation project, one that is looking at addressing um, you know, um, the ability of domestic agriculture to fulfill the food security requirements of the local population, they might, might come up with very different understanding of what they need, right? So for women uh, subsistence farmers, for example, who might not have had any access to any technology, be it, you know, some, some sort of fertilizer, seed, some uh, irrigation or whatever, in order to make, make their task easier, that might be just a very basic proven technology that for the first time they can say this is what we need, this is what would help us. And, and they might not want a GMO seed, but instead say, you know, we have a local seed bank, we have some traditional knowledge and experience with seeds, that's, that's what we want to draw on. Whereas somebody else might want to go, you know, um, if it's not differentiated, the, the default one would be um, more fertilizer, you know, more and stronger irrigation, and, and probably GMO seeds. So there are definitely technology differences. Yes, please. Uh, I want to add two components to, to read this framework of finance. Uh, one is the, 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 ma the dimension of macroeconomic from the gender perspective. We know that through the sexual division of labor, women are doing a lot of unpaid domestic and care work. So we have can use surveys all around the world indicating that women are working from, for instance, in a developing country, middle income country, 70 hours are supposed to the 40 hours that men are working. And in most of those 40 hours that men are working are paid, whereas half of the hours that women are working are not paid. So if you remember your Marx, or even your Adam Smith, if you hate the Marx, uh, you will know that the work is what gives uh, an added value to the, to the uh, material. So what we know in exercises in costing, well, in costing first through, if you were to pay a, a minimum wage on the work that women are doing, it would account in a country, at the country level, around 25% of the GDP. But that's only if you were to pay them a minimum wage. If you were to give them the right cost of each of the production they're making in doing the laundry and washing the dishes and taking care of the persons with disability and stuff, so it would amount to the 60% of the value that circulates in the world. 60%. That means there is not enough money in the world to pay for what the money the women are producing. That's the 60%. And then what the, the orthodox economy, what is measuring is about the things that get paid with value. So that's the 40% remaining. That's what the orthodox economy is measuring. So the implications of this is first, that women are subsidizing the entire economy. They're producing more value. Second, that it is the, the modern slavery because they don't get paid for their work and it's not even recognized. In this scary uh, um, picture that Leanne was telling us, what she, this is a matter precisely of financial justice because women are subsidizing the entire economy and, uh, and that they are getting the least of the benefits of that 30% economy that is running the money. The second figure I wanted to give you is that in the, under the 2030 agenda, it is said that we need three trillions to eradicate uh, hunger and poverty, three trillions. But we know that from 2004 to 2013, from developing countries to developed countries, 7.1 trillions went into illicit flows from the global south to the global north. 
meaning the global north, for instance, evasion of taxes, they're not paying taxes in the south, they're paying taxes in the north, or they're evading directly, or they're doing money laundering and stuff. So this is also to say that one, the global south is subsidizing the global north. And so for one dollar that goes from the global north to the global south in ODA or, or cooperation, eight dollars come out from the south to the north. So this is like the kind of dimension we really need to pose here on the table. First, in terms of gender equality and gender justice, and second, in, in financial justice overall, and the discussion on, on uh, on the Green Climate Fund, and you saw the, the ridiculous figure of billions when uh, um, Leon was showing us what is needed for mitigation and adaptation, but also the amount of money that is really running in the world, you know, and that it's also thanks to the sexual division of labor in the hands of men who are in the transportation sector, who are in the energy sector and the technology sector and so on. And on. So to us it's really important to have the big picture because when we're asking for gender equality in legal measures, in programmatic and budgetary frameworks or uh, at the global level, it is precisely for this sense of uh, just common sense about how we should start thinking about reshaping the world because it's so unequal at the time that 90, com and that comes linked to the public and private discussion, because 90 companies in the world are emitting the 75% of, of carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. So that also goes into saying if all the countries would get into an agreement of just re reducing dramatically their carbon emissions, you would find also in the hands of the private sector the responsibility of, of emitting the, the carbon emissions. And rather than saying we have to regulate them, the governments are saying, uh, so let's make an, a partnerships because we don't have the money and you do. Whereas they are largely responsible and there is no discussion so far to regulate the social and environmental impact of the of the private sector, especially corporations. So this is just a, a big overview. And uh, so when when Leanne is is trying to to point us to the discussion on on climate finance and how there is this tangling about no 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 let's not define no 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 uh, oh, all you want to do is uh, all you need is money. You're saying only matters money. It's like really and, and when you see this figure and you see developing countries uh, asking for money and have, asking for means of implementation and developed countries is are uh, like uh, all you care is about the money i think we need to put things in perspective so that we know what are we demanding and why this is only fair and makes sense yeah and i think this is i'm sorry and this is this is the reason why for example the women and gender constituency in the un framework convention is not just engaging, and I mean the slogan of um, not climate change, but systems change. And this is exactly what we are talking about, because if you're just looking very narrowly, um, actually the slice of international governance that is negotiated in the UNFCCC, you're losing the, the bigger picture of injustice, injustice done to men and women, but particularly also um, to, to women and, and communities. Um, and again, what we, are, what we are trying to do here in looking at some of the uh, specific climate financing flows is not saying that other part doesn't matter. It absolutely does matter, and that's why we always have to frame you know, a concrete demand on a fund or on a process into the larger context. But by the same token, there are access points and there are points of improvement um, why we obviously need to push for and, 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 and demand the systems change that we ultimately need, um, which is at the heart of, of climate change, um, that should not blind us to the possibilities that are within some of the existing structures to at least make it better. Not make it ideal. You know, none of us is rosy eyed and, 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 and naive and thinks that it's great, but by the same token, it's the right, it's the right of, of people in, in uh, developing countries and of women in developing countries to ask for fair, their fair share and it's a right um, that they have also in the existing structures and that's why some of us more than others are looking at some of the existing structures and trying to figure out how to improve that. 
Um, maybe I'll just, um, there was a question there, right? Just Sorry. a quick uh, yeah. clarification on what you said. Um, did you say 90 companies in the world? Corporations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are emitting 70% of the... Yeah. 75. 75. They are usually called the carbon, carbon majors because of that. Carbon majors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Salusina? I just wanted to uh, a bit uh, add um, also another additional perspective is the impact of all this on, on climate, on security, and the way it impacts women. Because many times, and particularly when Brussels, we started to get part of a group on security, where you have a lot of the mil some military stuff in a way that basically climate change is currently a lot affecting security issues all over the world. And this can, in another way, also affect negatively women in certain regions when they have weaker representation or balance in developing resilience to this kind of conflict. So this is another perspective on why gender is so important in, yeah, in all these climate adaptation scenarios. But so maybe it would be now would be a good point to hear from, from Titi and Aileen and, and also further from Amelia some of the concrete work that you are doing kind of, you know, yeah. what, what is the financing needs? That, that you have, how, uh, how are you working um, to, to bring that forward, what is the gender dimension of it, and then we might might be able to look back on, on some of the activities that again, it, within some of the existing funds, need to be reinforced in order to strengthen that the titty gets money and, and that um, I, you know, Eileen's work gets money and that Amelia's work gets money. Yeah, for, for maybe before, before I go into that, I need to respond to a, a few things that uh, Amelia said in terms of looking at the whole justice or the whole financial architecture. And I think I, I, it's a really very interesting picture that you have painted. But uh, looking at uh, the way some of these financial flows have come into the countries, there are a few things that are happening. For instance, most of the time we want to insist that these financial flows must be from public sources and it must not be conditional, it must not be loans. And uh, there's an interesting thing that we find out at the local level that some of the loans that they have uh, channeled into some of our countries, there is a way it's helping women. Yeah, the dynamics of how these loans are also given to these women is so different. But when you're talking about cooperation, no, 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 I'm not talking illicit about illicit flows. No, 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 I'm not talking about illicit flows. But you're I'm, saying that you were referring to what no, I was no, saying. No, 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 I said the, the, the justice picture that you painted, I said it's okay. Yeah. But Anna was crowding it on the issue of uh, uh, financial flow, climate finance coming in as loans. But, but, um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, where, yeah, what she was talking yeah, about. Yeah. We most of the time we want to insist that based on the justice aspect of it, that it must be from the public sources and also that it must not be channeled as loans. And we also know that some of these things, the real thing that happens within the UNFCC negotiations and some of these financial flows is that some of them come in, comes in as loans though some of them could be at concessionary rates. But there's a few things that we notice in terms of the loans at the local level and how women and women get access to these loans. You see, some of, they give it to them as loans and the women are using it, though it's a concessionary rate. It's giving, helping them to move on. It's helping them to address the issue of climate change within whatever they are doing. For instance, for the small scale farmers, they get some of this loan and they use it. But the only problem that we have at the local level is just that some of this funding for, um, from climate finance flows, we don't have much of climate information services to assist the small scale farmers. Those are not built into these loans uh, that are given to them. And for me, half of the time, we find out that these loans can go to waste at mm -hmm. the end of the day if they don't have the right uh, climate information services that will help them to ensure that they invest those funds properly. But for those who are able to get the kind of uh, uh, information, climate information services, and do the right thing, the loan is working for them. Honestly, I don't want to say that, but this is what we find out on the ground. So this is just something differently. But in terms of yeah. women, 
actually uh, getting climate finance. You see, it also depends on the what we call the normal NDA, I don't know, the National Designated Authority, Designated Authority in the countries, in countries, and it depends on how much uh, kind of um, engagement they have with the uh, with the marginalized group, with uh, women, and all the most important groups that needed the finances. And at the local level, I can tell you that most of the time when they do this engagement, it's not really told. It's not even like the way the GCF have said the sh it should be done. Yeah. And most of the time when they do it as a civil society organization, if you talk and engage with them, they, of course they will listen to you, but then that doesn't mean that they will also do it. So first of all, at that level, if the right people are not being engaged, you can be sure that almost half of those people who actually needed these funds are out, are out of it. So for those who find themselves in it, can they get the funding? First of all, you must also understand that it is either civil society that are executing entities that are really close to the local women if they are part of the executive entities within the framework of the funding, of the climate finance that comes in. But a few civil society organizations find themselves in also within that uh, space. For you to be an executing uh, entity, to be able to receive funds and work with the local community, there are some, so many certain things that you also have to fulfill. How many civil society have those kind of things that they're asking for? And then the only good thing is just that uh, they might be able to give it to civil society organizations also that are women focused or gender focused in terms of looking at gender issues. And there's a way they just put the, the issue of women. It's not as if it is mainstream into the other projects that they have. But what they do is that we have the silos approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's give women their own funding, let them do their women thing. But if they are putting funding into different sectors, in terms of let's say you are looking into health, you are putting funding also into agriculture, you are putting funding into water resources to address climate change issues in those sectors. They Practically, will not look at the gender aspect of it, but it could give them some kind of lump sum. But it now depends on those sectors if actually they will look at gender issues. But the fact that they have put women in a silos, they might likely not look into it. So, for us at the national level, also, it, it, there are so many other things that are happening in terms of women having access to this kind of uh, financial flows. So, it's basically depend on government. And, for instance, in Nigeria, we have the subnational level government, we have the state, and we have the national. So it depends on which of the yeah. governments the money is going, who's, who is getting it. If it goes to the national level, the national level decides that, okay, the federal capital territory is direct. But at the state levels, they could give to the states. The states too looks at, okay, let me work with the, some local governments at the level of the state. It will not be all of them. And if you look at local government governance itself, we have a challenge in terms of mainstreaming gender into what they do. And then you cannot imagine mainstreaming gender into their finances. Their budgeting is not gender sensitive. Nothing is like that. So it depends on how you as a woman you are able to actually position yourself to get some of this funding. Or if we have good civil society organizations who have been working with this local government, they might be able to put forward the case of women who need funding. Or perhaps talk with them and say, can we look at the gender aspect of where you are pulling this money into so that we ensure that there is a gender balance in terms of ensuring that men and women have access to these funds. At times, it's possible, but it is really very, very subjective because it is not something that has been institutionalized. So it could be a one-off thing. So that is what we see on the ground. But one good thing we have right now in Nigeria is that we have what we call the social investment funds. And the social investment funds, of course, we have the private sector doing it. Somehow, I was able to fight my way in. So I've been able to give to men and women. 
though the money is really very small, but it is doing a lot of things. So, but we look closely at the issue of climate change and poverty reduction because we have to marry the two together. Because if you are doing climate change and you are also not putting on the lens of poverty reduction, most of what you are doing may, may at times be counterproductive. So whatever we are doing in terms of climate change, we also look at the issue of poverty reduction so that at the end of the day, there are things that work together for the women and even men. Because right now when you are doing gender, you just don't have to look at the women alone. So we also look at the men. Where are the women men most vulnerable? And what kind of financing also they need in terms of uh, resilience building? Right. Well, thank you, um, Titi. And I think a couple of the things that she said, which I think I need a little bit, put a little bit into perspective uh, for people, it's just, um, we have the big challenge that a lot of women's organizations at the moment cannot directly access money. So Titi's organization cannot go to the example of the Green Climate Fund and says, I have a wonderful project. Um, I think you need to support me um, because the Green Climate Fund says, uh, you are not an accredited entity. Again, you have not established a formal relationship and the formal relationship in order to establish that um, needs a lot of proof that you will have all the fiduciary standards, meaning you know your, your books are in order, you have the uh, audit capacity and so on and so forth. And actually for most of the public climate funds, this is written in a way, to be quite honest, um, that largely only the international players, um, you know, the UN agencies or um, the multilateral development banks can fulfill it, but not TT's organization, right? So then you have those big players there. They don't want to um, even conceive or get started with a project um, that maybe TT's organization needs, which is $100,000 or $200,000. They are saying, you know, I'm not even starting to sharp my pencil until we are talking at least five to ten million because otherwise our transaction costs are way too big, right? So you have this disconnect that the money and the tranches of money um, that women of the grassroots needs are usually very small, but that those fund talking big. And again, Again, in terms of needs, it's not big, when you, but when you're talking at the individual uh, project level. And as an illustration, in the Green Climate Fund, the, the smallest project category, which is called micro, is actually up to 10 million. Mm -hmm. This is way more than you know, TT's organization would handle. It's also way more than they need. This is not the point. They don't need it, right? So again, Titi, tell her that you need it. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe Titi needs it. I'm sorry. I, I, I think she doesn't need it. But I, I, I would say so that Titi's organization would be very happy if there were a secure path for her to get the 200,000 that she needs to do yeah. fantastic work. Right now, this is extremely difficult. And again, so those of us that are working in the climate fund context are trying to figure out how can we make that possible, right? So. Um, in some funds, you have now started to talk about something called direct access, which means that you are not looking at international agencies like the MDBs or the UN agencies to actually be the one that get the money and then maybe parcel it out, but that you say, okay, some national um, entities, you know, it could be a, the Department of Energy, it could be an international, uh, it could be a national uh, uh, civil society organizations, if they can get accredited, again, the accreditation hurdle is still there, if they can get accredited, can access money directly, right? So this is a very important in the context stipulation, but it's probably still not enough to get the money, and again, sorry Titi, I'm just using your it's organization okay. as an example, to get the money to Titi's organization, because you still would be bound by the 10 million, um, having to prove that you do all the accounting gimmicks that are there so that the international contributors to the fund uh, you know, are happy with it, that you can prove that the money is well spent, um, you know, at least well accounted for, not necessarily well spent, but well accounted for, so you still have that disconnect. 
Now comes uh, a discussion that we have in the Green Climate Fund and actually another fund, the Adaptation Fund, has started that, where we are talking about enhanced direct access. Yes. So you're still following me, right? So we are coming from international access, which is the norm, meaning international organizations can access those, in, uh, those climate funds, to direct access, which means national or subnational institutions can do it if they become accredited, to enhance direct access. And enhanced direct access means you give a larger chunk of money to an, a national accredited institution and they then could channel it out in lots of smaller chunks to national or subnational or local institutions. And so, for example, when you hear about things like a small grants mechanism, you know, sorry about that. When you hear about things like a small grants and <laughs> mechanism, sorry, um, where, where you basically set up a structure and that can be very participatory, where you bring in stakeholders and maybe Aline can tell us a little bit about the dedicated grant mechanism that has supported indigenous peoples projects. Then you can give smaller tranches of money out that can be used um, directly, for example, for, 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 for civil society groups or local communities. And so you need to find openings like that and create openings and mandates, I'm very sorry, mandates like that in the fund structures of the existing funds in order to change it, get it away from the usual players and also make them understand that it's worthwhile to have a lot of smaller projects and you can't just look at one big project you know, as fulfilling fulfilling your, your climate purpose. But that then also means that you have to look differently of how you measure whether, I'm so sorry, uh, how you measure of whether uh, you know, a climate, for, uh, a climate um, finance project is effective or shows the right result. If you're just looking at emissions reductions, you know, and you say how many emissions reductions have I created and how little has it cost me, um, you will have a very different project then when you say, I want to reduce emissions, but I want to also make sure that women have, um, are provided with energy access and, for example, small you know, renewable energy uh, technology loans. Uh, I want to make sure that it's invested in, in the local communities. I want to make sure that it has social and economic co-benefits. That project, still a climate finance project, will look very differently. And the way to actually um, then, then come to a redefinition of what a good climate finance project is, is having to force a change in the conversation in those climate funds. And again, that's, that's the ongoing advocacy work that a lot of us are in there saying, you know, the better climate finance project is the one that has multiple benefits, that um, considers human rights, social benefits, it considers economic, the economic livelihood of, of the people who are supposed to serve. Yes, it does reduce emission. Yes, it does um, build the resilience, but it does lots of more things. And we feel this is the better invested money. Because you can invest, for example, in a large dam and finance with it human rights violations. So I would not say that's an efficient use of, of climate finance. But in the most of the current climate finance accounting system, it is because they are only looking how many emission, uh, emissions uh, for how much money are reduced. And so you need to change results measurement, um, how, how you know, effectiveness is measured, what is considered to be effective. And those discussions have to happen within um, those funding mechanisms. But I wanted to give um, Eileen the word because again, the indigenous peoples have been um, very powerful in their engagement uh, with some of the existing funds to actually create some different sub-funding mechanisms within funds, one called, for example, the dedicated funding mechanisms, and um, Eileen can tell us a little bit more about it, and then also how, you know, as an indigenous woman, she makes sure that some of the gender equality concerns that she and other indigenous women are, are kind of um, taken into account in the projects that they are advocating for. Eileen? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think in the indigenous people context, um, we have been looking for space 
at first at uh, our collective rights as indigenous people. And most of, most of the time, the he, woman's rights have been delayed or put in aside. And this has been one of the main uh, issues in the indigenous people's struggle for, I think, a long time. But now that we're talking about climate change, we have identified that indigenous women are very important in all these process of resilience and adaptation, mitigation, because we are the guardians, the transmitter of our traditional knowledge, most of their traditional knowledge. And as Titi said, being in the right place, doing the right advocacy is important. And I think um, we have been start working in all these um, access to um, to this decision making space, not at the national level, we start at the local level, in the community, in our territories at first. Because we saw that most of the natural, natural, natural resources are managed by men. In my community, for example, most of the leaders are men. So we start to work with women at local level, trying that and uh, making one negotiation with men so they can be part of the of the territorial board or the community board or maybe the women can be part of this um, natural resources management system in my community. And that was one step, small step I think, but it's a big a big uh, gain for my, my community. And then when you start to work with men, you realize there are some things that are not working fine about the redistribution in the communities. And I think one of the important things is that we have been doing this local community uh, grassroots work, and then we go to the regional uh, level in Nicaragua. We have an autonomy, a regional autonomy. And then we will, we will have been working in the international level and as Lian Sen say, uh, there, there are some spaces where the indigenous people have um, opportunity to have access to some funds. Because we know most of the climate change are very, most women in, in the communities have so many struggles because climate change. Uh, there is a lack of water, there is a crisis for the resources, and then we have some even migration because of this. Then we have other problems with immigration, like uh, trafficking of people or and women. And in in my communities, the, the human rights defenders and climate climate activists in my community, they are always in the line of danger. So. We say, okay, it's good to work in the grassroots, but we have to link this grassroots uh, work with international level. And um, for example, um, the IFAF uh, fund from IFAF is one example where you can say, okay, this is a good example about how the indigenous people and ex ex specifically indigenous women have access to funds. I, IPAF is a fund that is has this board. This board, most of the board are indigenous peoples. We have a, a, from Ethiopia, from Nicaragua, Bangladesh, and another country I don't remember right now. But so these people can decide about the different project. What of this? They review the project and they decide which of these projects are going to be approved. And as Lian said, they are not big projects, they are small ones, yeah. And then after this, we have uh, like, IPAC have um, three organizations, and one in Latin America, that is the International Woman uh, Indigenous Fund Forum, 
and then Tepteva from in Asia, and there is another in Africa. So these organizations are the link between IPAF and the communities. I have seen AINA activities that are the, the activities in Latin America, and you have this project between $5,000 to $10,000 in one community, that the woman, because most of the problem is that if you are a, a community organization, not all the community organizations in Latin America have a, this um, legal status, so they cannot have access to funds. But with this project, with this um, initiative of IPAD, you can have access to this project. You, have, you can have some work in, in to have access to water, to work with um, other communities in um, agriculture innovation, or to have uh, a little bit uh, action in, in, I don't know, there is a lot of small <laughs> projects. But I saw one with uh, Mayagna in Nicaragua that they have access to this fund, and it was just for how they can uh, rec recover one of these traditional trees that they used to have um, clothes from the bar. Oh, yes. And these are these kind of activities that the women are doing at, at, at local level to have access to funds. And you, they don't have to go through the national government or to the NDA that is so difficult to, to have access. And other thing is even CIF is, doesn't have now a, 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 a gender policy, they are open to, to indigenous people um, um, grants, so the indigenous people can access to these grants, small grants, initiatives. So I think there are some other um, activities. Even we, we want in some moment have access to the GCF fund because we think, okay, it's good to have this small, but we want to have access to more bigger action in our communities, in our forests, in our um, wetlands. So I think um, that was one of the things that we were thinking. What is, what is going to be the next step um, to have access in the, in the GCF? Because in the GCF, if you are not linked with an, with an, the NDA or with, a, with the accredited entity, you, you cannot be part of this. And this small organization or even our organization is really small. We don't, we could not manage them. This small, this small project of ten million dollars. Mm -hmm. So we say, what we is What is the next yeah. steps? But I think it's very important that we have to advocate in different levels. Of course, we have to advocate to have access. We have to advocate to look for. Um, Partner at the international level, so we can have strong roots and move not only at, at international, but this route can go on to, uh, to the, to the grassroots organization. And I think w most of our work with Teva is, is like that. We are doing a lot of grass work, grass root yes. work, <laughs> and then doing our advocacy at international yes. level. And this is having a, a very good uh, relation or communication. But there are other things to have access to, to funds. And I think it's important for indigenous women because indigenous women are like, um, they have triple, triple uh, discrimination because you are a woman, because you are poor, then because you are indigenous. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult sometimes to have access to this one. It's very difficult if you are never went to a school, you don't have <laughs> education. I went to the university, it was very difficult at, the, at first because of the language, but then, okay, I finished. But this is my case. There are other cases in the community that 
is not the situation. <coughs> so I think it's important to look for this space, for different space, for different partnerships with other organizations yeah. and for other indigenous organizations and women organizations at the international level. And most, I think even our collective right or struggle is very important. We don't have to uh, put aside the human rights of indigenous women because we are the, the we think we are the center of the indigenous culture. No, thank you very much, Eileen. And there were a couple of um, things just for, for, for people to understand. But one core message that I think is actually the pursuit of multiple avenues mm -hmm. yeah. and trying to find and create spaces. And it's both. It's finding spaces, but also through the advocacy, pushing for spaces in some of the existing structures. And those possibilities um, do, do happen. I mean, a couple of them were already mentioned. If it's not possible for, uh, for example, um, for for some of the local groups to get it credit, and they usually aren't, there is always the possibility, and, and Titi mentioned that word, um, in, in the LINCO to be an executing entity, which means that you partner with actually somebody who is accredited um, and will implement just a very small chunk of that project. Again, and then you can see that intuitively, if you would have a micro project of 10 million, it probably has three or four components, each of with um, several million um, uh, strong, under which you have uh, various activities. And those activities can have a number of partners. And what we are trying to do within the Green Climate Fund is to do two things. First of all, kind of um, a push for um, a mandate or a rule, which we haven't yet, but it would be my dream to have that, that you actually try in implementing, rely as much as possible on local expertise and local partners and not get outside expertise. You know, in the EU context, it's often called the subsidiarity rule, where you do implementation um, and partnering as local as possible. Uh, it would be great to have that as a policy advocacy push to do that in all of the climate funds that we have. So it wouldn't matter whether your accredited partner is um, actually a multilateral development bank, uh, it's a commercial entity, or it's a, 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 a domestic entity, they would be forced to go as local as possible. Um, and I think some of that um, is, is while not there as a mandate yet, um, I think through some of the discussions that we have had in the Green Climate Fund, there is at least, I think, a little bit more of an opening. And I think that's also where, for example, civil society can help in terms of uh, matchmaking or pointing out where there are potential matches to be made. And I give you one example, again, that's one of the Green Climate Fund. Um, there was a, a, a smaller, 10 million, um, project um, with a local bank, the Hass Bank in Mongolia, that as part of it had a kind of a capacity building and outreach um, element uh, pertaining to, you know, uh, bringing customers in, um, but obviously in a gender responsive way, meaning making sure that women are some, small women entrepreneurs are some of the customers for some of the renewable energy loans that, that they were able to offer because of financial support that they got from the Green Climate Fund. Now, the Hass Bank does not have neither the, the, the gender capacity, nor the understanding, nor the network to actually reach out to those kind of women partners within the country. But, for example, we encourage them, not that they haven't done it yet, but I'm just showing you as an example of what needs to happen more. We have pointed out to them that there is actually a women's a uh, Mongolia Women's Fund, which is a grassroots women's fund that funds in very small bits and pieces, you know, activities of women on the ground. If they were an official, you know, partner of that larger commercial bank for, for the grant component that does capacity building outreach, they would get some of the money. Right? They would get some of the money for the activities that they are doing anyhow. So it's trying to figure out whether we are able to create more opportunities. Again, we talked about enhanced direct access. My vision, 
would be, again, I have a lot of visions, not necessarily all coming through, that, but that part of, for example, a country's engagement with a multilateral fund like the Green Climate Fund, countries are writing country programs, which means they are trying to determine what their funding priorities for an engagement with an entity like the Green Climate Fund is. My vision would be that kind of a national or subnational small grants facility that is accessible and has, for example, a decision-making board that includes women, you know, from communities, and that decision-making board could be very well done. You know, if you fund that as part of a much larger project, it's it's all possible. You just have to shift the way they usually think about how um, to use financing. And then, and that's the other part, that's the money that you want to do directly available, but then you are still left with the part of the projects that you have and ensuring that they are as gender responsive as possible, right? Because a lot of them will not be the, the small project that benefits Titi or benefits Eileen, but will be the rapid bus um, transit system in, in a city worth 50 million, right? You still have a responsibility to make sure that that 50 million transport project is as gender responsive as possible, right? Because a lot of the financing is still going to be dispersed and flowing this way. And this is just a very, very quick checklist um, about some of the stuff that you might want to want to look and enforce at in making sure that, for example, a transportation project is as gender responsive as can be, right? Not all of them will be perfect. A lot of them will be still pretty sh shitty. But the hope is that with the force and push on more gender responsiveness, you make them better than they would be otherwise. And I really firmly believe into that. So what are some of the kind of checklist issues um, that you could look at to measure if and how gender was integrated? You could ask a set of questions. And obviously, th those questions also have related actions. You would ask. Um, does it approach gender issues from a human rights perspective? Really crucial. I mean, that's that's what Eileen was talking about with respect to indigenous people. They are uh, what is often called ethnic free prior and informed consent um, is crucial, meaning that you're not just you know presenting a project, but you actually get the agreement of the community, and that would, would mean indigenous community of men and women in the community that that is actually a project that they want to be engaged in, that they feel that it's something that is useful for them. Also, um, does it focus on the provision of basic services, um, right to water, food, adequate housing, right um, to, to basic energy? And that's very, that actually shifts what kind of projects you fund. For example, if you have a human rights perspective and you say it's the right um, to water or the right to food, you will probably um, not finance an agricultural project that is looking at um, uh, the export of flowers from Kenya to Europe, but will look at basically providing services to ensure uh, that, that the, the women that live in the rural area uh, can generate enough food that they can bring to, to the market, um, to the next biggest city, or um, in order to feed their own community. So the human rights perspective is very, uh, very, very important. Does it acknowledge and seek to redress gen gender inequalities? For example, you have a loan program, right? We know that very often and, and we can go back to that Mongolian bank that I, that I mentioned, the Khas Bank, right? So they are providing now uh, small renewable energy loans um, to a bunch of people. Now we know that very often women don't have what is called the collateral because they, for example, don't own property in their name to secure a loan. Now, the Khas Bank, in order to redress and acknowledge gender inequalities, would have to provide kind of a special set of loans that has a different risk assessment for, for women entrepreneurs and says, for example, it's okay for us that you do not have a collateral, 
Um, we take experience, you know, we get um, a, a set of reputation or, or other shared testimony money from people that you have engaged with and we are willing to maybe um, lend you a smaller amount initially, but to lend you an amount that builds up your credit history, that allows you the next time to get a bigger loan. So those are things that you would want to see addressed. Does it provide and analyze gender data? And this is really, really, really important. Um, what, what is not counted does not count. Um, and I want to just, in, in, with effect to uh, you know, gender and climate finance, just stress that again, this is really, really important. So if you say uh, you want to well help 100,000 people, how many of them are going to be men? How many of them are women? Um, if you want to look at households, how is the composition within the households? How many of them are, um, you know, are single female headed? Um, and you need to do that in order to show whether you have a result with the project that you are doing by starting out with the baseline. This is where we are, you know, when the project started. And that's then where we want to be in our goals and that's um, through monitoring and evaluation you check whether you are getting there. Uh, does it provide a comprehensive gender analysis? The gender situation, because it has so many political, cultural, and other dimensions, is very different in different contexts, in different sectors, in different countries. So you need to uh, have, a, have a comprehensive analysis. Um, does whatever you do provide equitable access to both men and women? So let's say you're doing the rapid transit system, which is like a bus system. But then, um, uh, because it's a fancy new bus system, you make the ticket prices for a single ticket so high that actually women you know, that have lower incomes or might not have their own income are not even able to access it. Then you have created a sneezy, wonderful bus, but you haven't provided equitable gender access. So those are things that you need to look in a project. Again, we are not talking doing something very different, we are just talking what you should be doing if, for example, you design a transport or an energy access or other projects. Does it provide equal opportunities for men and women to um, uh, give actually input and participate throughout the project cycle? And again, that's very important because what you often see, and I think most of them have gotten to that stage, they do an initial consultation, um, and usually the consultation is an information session, so they tell you what you want to do. And then they have a participants list that counts how many men and women are. What you don't have is a consultation very often where you ask men and women separately, what are your expectations on the projects? Do you think the way it's presented makes the most sense to actually improve your situation? What would be your idea, for example, of a technical approach that deals better with some of the challenges that you are facing to address climate change? And you don't do that at the beginning, but you feed in continuously. There is something called participatory monitoring um, that would actually, for example, give men and women of a project the opportunity to help set indicators of what they think, for what they think is a, is a sign of success. And that might not always be a gender disaggregated uh, in, uh, uh, um, indicator. It could be, you know, for women, it could be a success uh, that energy is created that prioritizes, um, you know, uh, uh, lighting for the local school. Versus men would have said, you know, uh, 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 the the the. Uh, it would be great if we have, and I'm being very facetious here, light in the local billiard bar and have that until midnight. So, I mean, that just means that you need to get those feedback rounds and realize that men and women might react to whatever you see implemented differently. Um, and then again, ideally, the benefits of a project shouldn't end when the financing for the project ends, but you create structures, including social structures, local institutions, a local way of interacting that is sustained beyond the funding period. And that's the question of whether you have created lasting impacts that actually have contributed to gender equality and to the empowerment of women. So, I'm sorry, I, I talked a lot, and I really apologize for that. So, wanted to check in 
Uh, first, with my co-presenters, if there are things that you would like to add and then yeah. questions that you have, please. Yeah, yeah because I only gave a framework, but I, there is something I want to share with the group. Uh, first of all, um, I'm going to skip, uh, I think, half of what I wanted to say, but I just want to share with you that there is this two processes that are being negotiated uh, right now. On, one is uh, on gender. We're having a, a gender action plan being negotiated. And uh, as you know, uh, there has been a big effort by the feminist movement in trying to include gender into all of the trends that are just being discussed under the COP. And since 2010, in the climate change COP in Cancun, we managed to get very strong language on gender equality as such in the in an operative para and also human rights. And from that on, point on, I mean, we already had gender equality in, in adaptation and some of the points, but then from that point on, uh, we started to, to have it very strongly. So this is important because not only uh, there have been these efforts on getting gender into the financial institutions, but also on throughout the whole discussion of the COP. And now we're discussing, we started with the Lima Program of Action, which was like a program of, if you know about gender, you know that gender should be mainstream, but at the same time, you also need to have a specialized uh, entity. So that would be functioning as our Lima program of action. And now, given that the Lima program only lasted for two years, now it's lasting uh, for another year. And that's the extension. That's what we're negotiating right now. And I mean, me, we're because I'm part of the Mexican delegation and we're negotiating as of to, today, tomorrow. This Saturday, there needs to be a resolution. And uh, one of the components, so we have several components the, uh, related to the different decisions that have been made under the COP, such as gender balance and gender uh, women's participation. The other one is in capacity building. The other one is implementation at the national level. The other one is coherence between the UN system. As you know, we have a 2030 agenda and all this UN system uh, mandates, such as also in the CSW, which by the way, this year we just managed to get just transition of the workforce in the CSW, which is the Committee of the Status of Women. We had that in the Paris Agreement preamble. And this is so important because all the workforce that will be having new jobs or losing their jobs and how are you getting them into this new transition, it has to have not only uh, human rights in terms of labor, but also according to gender equality, how will that reshaping will be without reproducing the sexual division of labor or adding burden on their women and such and such. So this is really important because there is a coherence across the whole UN system and we're trying to get that into the, and the gap, the, the gender action plan, as it was never done before. I don't know if you know, but under the COP, uh, given that it considers, it's the, it considers itself, the UNFCCC being a technical body, they argue that they should not abide by the human rights framework that mandates the entire system of the UN. So this has been a challenge uh, rep rapidly throughout the years. And uh, so to us, getting a reference of coherence throughout the UN system in the gap is just a major point of entry, even though if it's just from a small uh, program under the UNFCCC, to try to bring that big discussion of human rights inside the, the UNFCCC without without mentioning it. So the other element is precisely uh, in, in implementation, well, the, the other component is uh, reporting and monitoring, but under implementation, we have a, a section on means of implementation, which is capacity building, technology transfer, and finance. So in the section on finance, uh, there was an action referred to how to to bring uh, the Standing Committee on Finance to discuss the different ways in which all the financial institutions under the UNFCCC have been implementing uh, their gender mandates, but also how to improve them. We wanted to make it on access, direct access, but uh, developed countries refused. So as of now, <laughs> 
we we got to to defend the land, which is still only the the second day of the negotiations. It will keep keep on going until until Saturday. So please do make a lot of noise that we really need to have this this and. Um, Maybe, maybe if we get that, this mandate in overall and general terms, maybe when we are shaping the dialogue for next year, we will bring direct access into the discussion. Mm -hmm. But it's good because for the first time, we want to have all the financial mechanisms to sit down and to not only to report, oh, this is what I'm doing, because we, we care about, about what they're doing, but we care more about what are the challenges and what are ways to improve. And so to have them sitting around at the same table and hearing what we want to say and the local communities have to say about the type of access they have will be major. So that's one thing. And the other thing, we want the, the financial mechanisms to report on the, on the mandates that they've been having in a, in a, and to have a synthesis report so that we can monitor their advance. So that's the kind of things, I mean, we are discussing many things in, under the gap, but I think this is really relevant uh, as to, to do a follow-up, uh, not only um, yearly, and uh, to increase the mandates on gender, but also to report on what we are doing, and luckily to have exper experts like Leanne to come and give an input into these kind of dialogues to really improve and to hear people on the ground to tell them what's not working. And I think also, for instance, it's not only a problem of, of uh, local uh, communities or NGOs, it's also a problem of local authorities. As you know, cities are now stepping up to try to, to face the challenge. The US, one of the two biggest emitters, stepped down, and now we see the importance and the relevance of cities and local authorities. And many of them do not also have the access to these funds. So it is really important to try to really make, a, a, it seems technical, but it's really a common sense discussion on points of entry, ways of action, modes of operation of these uh, funds, so that we really have the, the climate policy that we want to see. And of course, uh, I will just add that uh, in my area of work, which is gender budgeting, I mean the expenditure, the fiscal frameworks at the national level or local state level, uh, that the way in which you reshape the way in which uh, um, the local expenditure or the public expenditure is being allocated, it has to come with a gender perspective in different ways. And as, uh, for instance, in Mexico, we just achieved that. We have that as um, in, the, in the fiscal law, so all the country has to, to, to make its budgetary allocation with a gender perspective. And despite this, we have only achieved 1% of the total local budget. So when we were saying about, oh yeah, we don't like private, we like public, but then when you go into the, and dive into the world of the public expenditure, you see all these challenges as well. I mean, that's for another seminar and workshop <laughs> and how we're trying to bring coherence between the fiscal uh, systems between the 2030 agenda and the climate uh, change and the Paris Agreement because for instance, um, it's really important that to see this climate change to be mainstreamed and gender equality mainstreamed and to be part of the expenditure. And uh, the other thing I think that is really useful from the 2030 agenda perspective is about inequalities between countries and the externalization that governments from the north are giving in the governments from the south. So this is really important because again, um, there is no way in which Germany, for instance, that in the Olive Jeffrey Sachs uh, rating is putting Germany now in numbers ranking six in fulfilling the 2030 agenda and Colombia in 64. But as the Ministry of Environment of Germany was saying, it's because Germany is in ranking sixth that Colombia is ranking 64 because of the externalities, because, because it's, uh, it's uh, exporting all the negative impacts into the South, is that precisely Germany can be able to be in ranking sixth. So that, that level of discussion of externalities, inequalities among countries is really relevant to maybe to reshape the discussion that we're having on the, the UNFCCC in terms of uh, common but differentiated responsibilities that it seems like it's really old, that sounds repetitive, uh, we, don't, we don't 
get enough of that principle all over now in this discussion as of now, but we really need to bring this again to the table and how is that going to impact precisely the kind of challenges that countries have at the national expenditure because not a single country can face the challenges that we're seeing now, such as climate change. No? So we need, really need a, a multilateral discussion and measures that are jointly uh, decided. And uh, well, it's just an invitation to, to keep on thinking, thinking that uh, macroeconomics and uh, finance or uh, fiscal systems are really, really only tools that people shouldn't be scared, are only tools to, to help us in our fight for for, for gender justice, social justice, environmental justice, and we have to take ownership of those and, and really engage in, in the discussions on transparency, accountability, and reshaping the, the way in which these instruments, as, as Lian was saying, we have to, they're, they're useful, they're really useful. We shouldn't dismiss them and we, we need to, to take ownership of them. So I would invite Eileen and, and Titi um, want to, uh, obviously if there are questions from you, first of all, I, I congratulate you for sticking around <laughs> yeah. and um, looking at least halfway still interested. Wanted to give Titi and, and Aline the possibility to add. I uh, wanted to see if there are any, any questions um, from you or comments. I mean, there's obviously a lot of information. Um, do you feel that that has been useful for you? Is that something that has scared you off? The last thing that you wanted to do is definitely not scaring you off because I think it's particularly, you know, for, for feminists and, and gender advocates that it's important that we increase our understanding of those, you know, our financial literacy of those processes, also of macroeconomics, as, as um, uh, Emilia has helpfully pointed out because they are part and parcel of what is keeping good women and a lot of us down and in, in the global system and the national system and in local systems. Um, so again, just because we have about 10 or 15 minutes left, see if there's some feedback, want to give Titi and Eileen an opportunity and then as the last thing, really the last thing, I plug some literature and then we're done. I, since you asked for feedback, I just sure. want to thank you all. I, I learned so much today. I, I understand your point about at all levels. I understand how important this is and how the systems have been set up in a way to exclude women and exclude women's access to um, the, the money that is available. And so uh, I really just want to thank you all for such an informed and concise and, and detailed uh, it, set of uh, uh, information from all of you. Just terrific. Yeah. You can also tell us if you didn't like it. I mean, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is a workshop. Sure. Like any kind of feedback yeah. and interaction. So. I don't know. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you again. Um, I, I do have a doubt about the. Um, because this framing, the, the framing the global climate change and uh, into a gender thing, but didn't get clear to me much until um, the first panelist was there pointed how it actually affects in terms of traffic of women, which I was kind of like related to a, a big problem that affects women lives. Uh, how, how to avoid that when you get the resources to be you know, directed to the gender specific, mm -hmm. to not depend in the female face of the same patriarchal problem. In South America, I, have, oh, I, mean, I, I come from Peru, mm -hmm. and I, uh, in South America, it happens quite a lot. That is, uh, it's a big movement for gender equality, but then. <clears throat> When you get to put a um, you know, representative of, of the female gender in, the, in a certain power position, it actually is absorbed and became part of the same system. That's what I mean. It's like it just became the female face of the same patriarchal structure of power. Mm -hmm. I just uh, yeah no no no. I think it's a it's a very important point, and uh, I think that's that's one of the concerns that uh, that a lot of us um, have with 
a focus just on, for example, the gender balance in in various in various organizations or on various boards, um, because gender balance um, obviously doesn't mean that with you know bringing more women and you necessarily bring in more gender expertise. And again, it's it's the expertise how both men and women benefit. You know, obviously there is a lot of lot of focus on the empowerment of women because they have been underpowered through the system a lot, so there, there is a lot of focus. But it's really, that's why we're saying, I mean, for me, um, to talk about 100% gender responsive climate financing as a goal is as kind of natural because, you know, you want it to benefit people, not systems, not corporations. 100% of people are affected by gender dimensions. Right? Because you're not just talking women's empowerment, you're talking men and women's and non-binary people's empowerment. Um, even if you can't bring that discourse yet in, in, into, into a lot of the, the, the formal discussions because you know a lot of the men that are decision makers are not there yet. Obviously, um, there is always, I think there is always a chance that, that by being integrated, um, people of both genders get corrupted. For me, this is another another reason why to look at the multiplicity of approaches and avenues. You know, just just not put your your entire um, eggs in one basket. I would never assume that the gender action plan for the UNFCCC is the end of all of our problems. You know, and and from there on, the the climate convention is wonderfully gender mainstream. It's one step, maybe not even the most important one, probably more important than symbolic power than in actually enforcement value, but I personally would put my energy more on making sure that uh, financial negotiators understand that you know making financing gender responsive, that you have to look at differentiated needs and opportunities as a way to making sure that the little money you have has better outcomes would be a better investment. So it's the, the multitude and each of us, you know, with our own expertise and our own backgrounds can have different ways of, of, of contributing to that. It's not a single one. If I can say something, women can be corrupt, silly, uh, <laughs> unprepared as men. And yeah. men have been corrupt, silly and unprepared ruling this world for centuries. Yes. So, but we are half of the population, and we deserve half of the places of representation and in government. So, just is I just want to say that we shouldn't naturalize gender. It's not a, embedded in our genes as women. It's because it's we have studied a lot. The gender framework is a specialized uh, trend of thinking, a, a tradition of thinking. Men and women should study it and should apply it to their own fields. So we shouldn't just uh, tend to think that just because you're women, you're, you're women uh, in government, you naturally have all the gender learning because we really study a lot. And men can learn and study and apply gender perspective into their, into their actions. So I'm, I'm really against judging women for having a conservative view and then expecting only to have liberal women in, the, in government because uh, actually I, I, I promote freedom of thinking and I want women to be conservative, liberal, traditional, progressive, uh, whatever identity, indigenous and stuff. It is on the level of ideas that I hope that we liberals and progressive, we will fight and win to the conservatives in the governments. But we women have the, are entitled to have 50% of the places, and we shouldn't judge a, a woman to be conservative just the way in which, which we don't judge a man for being conservative just because he's a man, you know? So I think that we should broaden the, the perception and not judge too harsh women, but rather to judge the system and men and women who are doing poor decisions and poor policies and discriminatory laws, and we need to change those those uh, those those tools by means of this expertise that Mian was saying in a multi-layered uh, way. I think uh, I just have a key message here, and the message is that uh, finding ourselves here, we really need to work together and see where we need to be able to advocacy 
for women to have more funding, and also what kind of partnership as uh, members of the women gender constituency or gender uh, network, how do we work together to ensure that we make those spaces available so that local organizations also can benefit, local women can benefit, whether at the national level, subnational level, or at the global level. And I think for all of us coming in here, it means that uh, we can work together, we can create the spaces, we can do the advocacy that is necessary so that this money can be in the hands of women. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just want to a little bit like Didi. I think uh, advocacy is one of the main issues for indigenous women because and we want we we think that we have to do advocacy at local level first and then we can scale up our our demands, our rights, our recognition of rights. And there are so many experiences in indigenous people and I know from Latin America and Central America where indigenous women are capable of manage some money and not only at national level but the women in the community so I think we, we have to stop thinking that indigenous women are not capable of doing finance uh, yeah, administration and the other thing is that um, um, most of the in my in my region, most of the programs that work with indigenous women have this gender vision, but not all have this climate uh, and climate change resilience vision. But I think it's it's important to do a overlap of these two issues, mm -hmm. and most of the organizations are not doing that. Most organizations work in just gender or just environmental. I think it's important to work this thing together. And most with most with indigenous women because the forests or the wetlands or the savanna are very important for our livelihood. So if there is nothing from the participants, then again I'm so proud of you for sticking it out. <laughs> you know, the last workshop of the, the people's Climate Summit, and uh, you are here until seven. Well done. Thank you so much. And I also wanted to point out largely because I carried it over there and I worked like hell to get them ready for COP that we have a couple of briefings. They are part of a series that the Henry Fell Foundation does together with an organization called the Overseas Development Institute. As part of a website we have that tracks actually public funding and some of the existing climate funds called Climate Funds Update. And one of the thematic briefings that's back there is on gender and climate finance. I updated it myself just before coming to COP, so I think that provides actually a relatively good overview of some of the arguments and the interconnections that we have um, given you here. There is also one that has that horrible chart that you saw, but updated and explains a little bit what um, our climate funds, public climate funds are out there, so it's about the global climate finance architecture. There is something, if you were captivated by the Green Climate Fund and want to find out more what happens with that fund, how complicated is it, and to be quite honest, after you've read it, uh, it's probably even as complicated or even more complicated than you fear that it is. And lastly, one which I think, and again, that's how I started out, which is really important um, for all the work that I'm doing uh, and the work that we do with partners, Again, we don't see it as a technical exercise, but something that is deeply rooted in an understanding of a human rights-based approach, in an understanding of a justice approach, and that's why I have that little thing, which I think is still useful, even just to evaluate what is not happening in climate finance, namely the principle and criteria that should guide public climate finance particularly, because I think there is a particular role for the public sector. The ones that I brought along, uh, only in English, but I want to point out that we were succeeding just this morning to put those briefings up also in French and Spanish. I can't guarantee that the Spanish translation is super, but you probably have a better understanding 
than when you, uh, some of you might read it in English. So this is available and that's available on our website um, us.world.org. You would then have to look for actually um, the, the, the area um, that is um, um, looking at climate policy and finance and you find all those publications um, on there. And just again, if you are interested to learn a lot more about the Green Climate Fund, um, which I'm very heavily engaged in because I represent um, a developed country civil society as one of the observers on the board. Um, there is a timeline about the Green Climate Fund. A lot of the work that we have done at Heinrich Böll to strengthen the gender focus in the fund, and those are all resources. That's unfortunately only in English, but those are all resources that are available. And would love if one or some more of you would take a look at it and see if that can be useful for your work and your understanding. Yeah. And with that, I would want to thank you again for coming and sharing the past two hours with us, and I appreciate your interest. Thank you. Yes.